It's Sunday, March 17, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a podcaster, political activist, writer, and Jersey mom, known online as Jojo from Jers. Joanne Carducci, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, I love how uh, activists such as yourself, who have also taken to podcasting, all have a kind of different brand uh, to kind of make their point. H- how would you describe yourself, just before we get started, considering the, the, you know, the, the, the landscape of, of, of activists who've taken to social media like you have? I mean, I think... First and foremost, um, I have, I'm a mom. (laughs) I live a Jersey suburban mom life and I have to be true to who I am. So behind everything I write, behind everything I say is always that undercurrent of truth that I live a very, you know, average suburban mom life. And I think about things in those terms always. And so that's the way I try to convey them always. It's really important, isn't it, that we hear from women because politics invariably is run by old white men and a lot of the commentary is from white men and there is a theme of white men that uh, you know tends to to permeate america's politics certainly um it's it's it, it's ironic really considering that this election in november which we now know is joe biden versus Donald Trump. It's pretty much been been ratified that they've both got the job. Uh, do you do you think that there is um, enough of a an understanding of how important this election is for women? And and do you think people on the right have maybe underestimated women as voters in the lead up to this election, considering that so many of women's rights have been taken away under Republican leadership? I mean, I would say it's a very bad idea to underestimate women in any election, but this one in particular, given what we've lost in the last few years um, and given all we stand to lose, this is definitely not one where women are going to sit out and be quiet. Um, And I think, you know, there is this, there's more appeal in terms of you know, women coming to the side of voting for Democrats in this election that is broad across the political spectrum because Republicans have done that. They have made it that way. They didn't just, you know, stop. They didn't stop at abortion. They're now talking about IVF. They're now talking about contraception. And, you know, a lot of women who might say, I'm not political or I don't do politics. Well, politics does you. And um, in this particular case, even if you're not having children yourself, maybe you have a, a daughter like I do. My daughter's about to be 11. And that's top of mind for me. I have to think, you know, is she going to have you know, no access to contraception or what if she can't conceive a child and she wants one? Um, so I think Women like me, who do do politics, have to keep getting really loud about not only what's at stake in this election, but what we stand to gain, because there's two sides to that coin, and we can't just focus on one and ignore the other. So I am doing my part to get that word out there. And I think the more I have those conversations, you know, relational organizing, so to speak, with my peers, my friends, the moms, you know, at the baseball games, the more they're like, I didn't know. I didn't know that. I had no idea. I mean, I saw that with with shootings, with mass shootings, where my own friends who don't usually engage with me on politics, after the Kansas City shooting recently, they were all texting my phone about how we have to do something. And one of my friends even said, do women know? Do they know? Are they getting involved? And I was like, yes, why don't you come and join us? And we can have more of these conversations and actually, you know, make the change we see. It is interesting, isn't it, how people... When, when, when life is okay, or when you don't have a authoritarian character in the in the White House, as with Donald Trump, and you know he's promised a, a dictatorship for his next presidency if he wins, if you don't have someone like that around, a lot of people are disengaged from politics, aren't they? Because it's like, well, you know, no one's going to start a third world war. But the moment Trump came along, that really changed, and it did suddenly encourage people who were maybe 
you know, non plus regarding who, you know, who, who was their representative suddenly woke up and realized what's at stake. And we saw that with the women's marches. You know, I think people forget quite how mm -hmm. weird it was during Trump's four years and the amount of protests and pushback there, there was, not just from Democrats, but from people who recognized that Trump was a, an existential threat to, to normality. Yeah. And I also think as a mom, I've long since said this about him, of all of the things about him that are awful, it is that he is the embodiment of everything I tell my kids not to be, everything I tell them not to do, everything I tell them society will not reward them for. I mean, it's, 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 it's layers of awfulness and, and, and vengefulness and mean. I mean, he's, mean he's a bully you know mm. and i've always told my kids that bullies don't win that they don't prevail at the end of the day and of course that message was wrong in 2016 which was what set me on a journey of making that right because i couldn't square with my children how the bad guy won and i think that's why so many people but particularly women were activated so to speak in 2016 because this was someone who bragged about sexual assault you know this was someone who demeaned women, who called women dogs. This was an affront to, you know, womanhood. And we don't, we don't endorse bullies like that. We don't endorse sexual predators. But as, as moms, um, we want our children to have someone in that office that they can aspire to be like. And he was the antithesis of that in every single possible way. Yeah. M my kids hate him. <laughs> they, they, you know, they, they hear me talking about him and they they hate him but it reminds me as you were saying that of you know i've seen pictures from trump rallies where families are being interviewed and they brought their kids along and the kids all dressed up in trump memorabilia and merchandise and the kids like yeah trump and i'm like whoa this poor child doesn't stand a chance in this world with with parents and and you know the role models like like the former guy i mean i will say this though I mean, yeah, I do. It's funny. They're always screaming grooming and indoctrination. And yeah. meanwhile, they're bringing their kids to some of the most you know, hateful content there is. But sometimes in life, like, I mean, I grew up with a Republican father. Sometimes in life, what your what your parents model actually instructs you to do the opposite. Right. And I think fundamentally that as human beings, this might be a little naive of me, but I think fundamentally we're good. And that we want good things and we want kindness. You know, we want, it, we want to be treated kindly, but we also want to treat others kindly. And I think maybe, and this is, again, probably being optimistic, which I've been accused of from time to time, maybe some of those kids will walk away or grow up thinking, oh, that's terrible. I didn't enjoy that. I feel so, feel so heavy. And why are they so mean? I mean, a, a good chunk of them won't. <laughs> but, you know, even if some of them do, it, it's better than none. But still, I mean, it's just they're modeling so much intolerance and so much hate. And it's it's terrifying, really. This week, we saw the vice president, Kamala Harris, standing in a, a planned parenthood clinic in Minnesota. And, and she said out loud for all the world to hear the words uterus and the word abortion and contraceptive care. I mean, these are not things that you normally hear in a, in a kind of uh, certainly in an election cycle. And and to me, it was very momentous. And I think a lot of the media reacted and said, this has never been done before. And it surprised me. I was like, what? Like, no one has ever gone to a, a, an abortion clinic and, and done some electioneering, considering that abortion is such a hot button issue in this country. I do sometimes feel, and I say this as a European, and with the greatest of respect, Joe, that the US is like sometimes 20 or 30 or 40 years behind the rest of the world. You know, and it's, it's like really having to play catch up. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people who would very much like to push us even further backward. Yeah, but right. I think, yeah, but forever. I mean, abortion is this, it's really flipped. The whole script has flipped. I mean, I grew up taking Roe, I wouldn't say, I guess, yeah, for granted, because it was settled law. You know, I, I never had to think about, I remember talking to my father's second wife and he had three and the second wife. She had this mark on her arm and we started talking about, I don't know, going back in time to when she was young. And then that sort of, I don't know how, but it turned into a conversation about her, her life growing up and how abortion was illegal. And I was like, what? 
what do you mean? And I, I didn't even really know what abortion was yet, but the way she explained how her friends would use coat hangers to give themselves abortions. And it sounded just so like barbaric. And I, yeah. and I was like, well, we don't have to worry about things like that now. Like, and then you see the movie um, Dirty Dancing and that's a big part of the theme. And, but Roe was something that I never really thought I would lose. I'm, I'm so optimistic that I didn't think I would lose it even when Donald Trump had three Supreme Court picks. I thought this is settled law. They gave us every indication that they would, you know, support that. Of course they lied. Um, but you know, I just, I get, I, I get the idea as a European that we look pretty like old school or, or slow back backwards, you know, but it's just I a bit antiquated. That's all antiquated. I mean. And considering yeah. that, I mean, the UK had its first female prime minister in 1979 right. and, right. and, and she was, uh, you know, arguably one of the most famous and, and, you know, had great relations with Reagan and the like. But the point is that, you know, the, the first female has made it into the White House mm -hmm. only three years ago. And right. the other thing that I'm hearing that I'm keen to talk to you about is that there is, um, I don't know whether it should be taken seriously or not, but, well, tell a lie, it should be taken seriously, that people are saying that they wouldn't vote for Joe Biden because if he doesn't survive or whatever, that then they're going to get a black female president, mm -hmm. and they don't want that. Yeah, I mean, I think Barack Obama's successful eight years without scandal broke a lot of brains in this country. <laughs> a lot of people really, really triggered by that that didn't even realize that they were carrying around that sort of resentment. Um, yeah, so the idea of a Kamala Harris presidency is something that, that again, is, is a big motivator for them to definitely make sure, if they can, that, that Trump prevails, which is really sad. But she's she's an incredibly capable person human being you know she's she's been a senator and a state attorney general i mean she's she's incredible she's got a resume that is you know unrivaled but the fact that she's you know a, a black asian american woman is just too much for them to possibly they'll take a, a 91 times charged adjudicated rapist business yeah. fraud yeah. over Kamala Harris over Joe Biden, but over Kamala Harris. I mean, and it's it's really sad, but that is one of the big drivers is race. I believe racism is how we ended up with Donald Trump to begin with. I agree. So much of the analysis that I do always ends up at the end of a long corridor with a door marked racism. And it's very, again, it's very sad. Obviously, racism exists across the world and also the caste system as well which i think is something that people need to think about because not everything is racism a lot of things are caste too mm -hmm. and the sense that some are superior to others mm -hmm. and that really is very much uh you know embedded into republican thinking especially maga republican thinking isn't it this this superiority which is so weird because they're <laughs> often voting against their own best interests Exactly. I mean, they're most often voting against their, their best interests and their party is not really even offering them anything anymore, except for what you just said. I mean, there's this idea that their just birthright of being born you know, superior is under attack. And again, it's a false premise, but it's one that, that maintains so many things for Republicans because it gets these people to support them despite the fact that they have done nothing for them and the fact that they will take things away from them. Um, but if they keep playing this hand that the, you know, those people, them, they, those people, some unseen force is coming for that. They don't even have to really name that. What they often say is for your America, right? Yeah. For your way of life. And what they're tapping into is that anxiety that this, you know, castle that they've manufactured in their mind that they occupy as white people or, um, you know, non-minorities is under threat. And it's, um, it's been, a, it's a playbook that we've seen throughout history. Obviously it's not new. And, um, this idea is not new to our country for sure. And the irony is that the whole native American story has been like brushed <laughs> under the carpet in order for them to feel good about being the original Americans. Right. I mean, that's what's so crazy about this is, is, is that is that they aren't. They're just as much migrants as people coming across the southern border.
And they so conveniently forget that. I think that's also one of the the big prongs of what's happening right now is this attack on our own history, our own accurate history. They don't want that recounting because it exposes what you've just said. You know, it exposes these lies. And um, that's why they don't want us talking about slavery in accurate terms or at all. And it's one of the things that's baked into the cake about America, unfortunately, and hopefully it will change. But it's that we've we've really whitewashed a lot of our history. I mean, just look at Thanksgiving, you know, American Thanksgiving. I grew up with that whole <laughs> picture of them, the you know, the Indians coming with the maize and the fish. And I, let's it's pretty um Hallmark card sort of <laughs> like yeah. whitewashing. But um, I think it's also fundamental to some of that idea that, you know, these people have that they should be superior on the basis of nothing else but the color of their skin. Um, and it won't serve them in the long term. But as long as Republicans can take advantage of it, they're going to. Let's go back a, a little bit to um, abortion and race, because more than a, a quarter of uh, black female voters describe abortion as their top issue. In, in this year's presidential election. This is a, a poll out on uh, Thursday from the uh, health policy research firm KFF. And, and, and these findings signal a, a real significant shift from previous election years when white conservative evangelicals were more likely to peg abortion as their biggest priority when voting. Those voters were highly motivated in, in you know, the, the recent elections to cast ballots for Trump, who promised to appoint Supreme Court justices who would take away the constitutional right to abortion. And Trump now, you know, continues to own it. He, he, mm. He's very proud of the fact that he's like, he says no one else could do it. They tried and they failed and I got it done. Black women do not make up a huge proportion of the electorate, though, do they? And so it requires all women to get behind black women and, and really a, a huge movement. Do you think people understand the significance of this vote in, in November when it comes to, you know, these issues and representing minority groups? Um, I think that they're, you know, a little late to the party, but, you know, it's because this isn't a narrative that's been put before them as often as it probably should have been. You know, this does disproportionately impact black and brown communities. There's no question about it. And I think that that, you know, that, that uh, those stories have been tossed to the side a little bit. Um, yeah. I think that it's it's important that we keep, like I said, keep talking about them um, because we do have an obligation, I think, as women, as human beings, as Americans, you know, to do the, what we can to help people in those communities. And, and abortion is health care. And going back to like how antiquated things are here and how crazy it is that our first female vice president said the words abortion was added a, a, a clinic that offered abortion services in 2024 is there's connection to the way the word abortion has always been perceived as a bad word in this country. Yeah. Um, and it's healthcare. And finally, now that it's under attack, are we beginning to realize that But for so many women in those communities, those underserved communities, this is a real crisis. Plus you know, the, the infant mortality rates in these in these communities and among black and brown women in America is also something going back to Europe that our peers must look at us and say, what is going on? How is this happening in the United States of America? I mean, there's some states like Louisiana where it's off the charts and uh, we have to talk about it because these are Americans, too. And as a society, you know, we're only as strong as our weakest links. And if we let parts of our society just you know, wallow without any sort of reproductive freedom whatsoever. Um, we're per perpetuating a really bad cycle. Um, and I don't, you know, I think that we can move the needle for sure if we have these conversations more often. The other um, thing that I, that kind of shocked me when I first started, you know, doing, doing the news in the US was that no one really talks about the poor. So poor people don't really get much coverage. There's a lot of talk about the middle classes. And you know, the, obviously, lawmakers are very much at the at the centre of this. The, the The middle classes seem to play better when they're when they're you know making their policy announcements. 
But the reality is that, you know, those black and brown women that we're talking about who are suffering the most when it comes to lack of abortion access is because they are poor in comparison to white people in America. That's really the crux of this, isn't it? Why, why do you think America tends to ignore not just the poor, but the description of the poor? Again, it's like that dirty little secret about America, right? We don't we don't want to talk about it. Um, it's just, again, back to this idea that it's fundamental to who we are. And I don't mean that it's fundamental to all of us, but there's this, this undercurrent that exists where we... I, you you Brits have a stiff upper lip, right? Stiff upper lip, does that yeah. care? Apparently. Carry on? I, I don't think I do, <laughs> but I, I, I appreciate that some do. Well, we have, I guess, our own sort of version of it where it's like a little bit of denial <laughs> all right. the time. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, it's like, don't look over there. It's uncomfortable. That's one of the reasons, too, why we're seeing this. This You've seen it. This like, no CRT, even though it's not being taught to school age children. Um, they don't want to talk about those the real things because then it threatens their claim to superiority and so it's like this this dirty little secret and it's it's really inaccurate but it perpetuates itself the longer they do that and don't acknowledge what's really behind you know the fact that these black and brown women are the ones living in the poorer areas and that doesn't make any sense unless it's systemic which it is but they don't want to have those conversations and it's worse than not wanting to have those conversations now they're going out of their way right to proactively make sure no one has those conversations and our kids never hear those conversations so we can keep perpetuating the cycle because the american electorate is changing physically changing in a way that threatens the the, the very existence of this whole thing they keep trying to perpetuate the, the CRT example is a really good one, isn't it? Because, as you say, it's not taught in schools. It's not a thing. And yet it has become a whole talking point for Republicans. And the quiet part that no one is saying is that it doesn't exist. And, and, so, and yet there are school board meetings going on about it. And there's all this, you know, propaganda about it. And angry parents talking about it. And and no one seems to have said, but it, it's it's not true. <laughs> and that is what I find so amazing is that the country and the media are to blame as well because the media could have cut this off, you know, at the at the source, but they failed <laughs> to because you know it's good it's box office, isn't it? To you know to see people shouting at each other in a you know in a school hall. Yes. And what is that saying about the truth? Right, a lie can make it halfway around the world before the truth even gets its pants on, right? So that's yeah, right. that's a, the successful strategy when you don't have anything to offer. So it's part of this whole fear mongering, um, othering uh, narrative that is helpful because it distracts from the stuff that like they're not doing or the stuff they could be doing and or the stuff Democrats are doing. So they have to pick targets and sometimes the targets have to be benign enough. Often they have to be benign enough and, you know, nebulous enough that the people that they're working on, the people they're trying to scare don't know enough about. Yeah. Or it, can't check. Or, right. Or could check, but just don't really. <laughs> you just won't. Yeah. Because it's won't. convenient. You know, right. Exactly. So CRT is one of them. It's one that, mm -hmm. I mean, constantly, constantly. I push yeah. back because I know. But they have all these boogeymen, right? So it's not just CRT. It's this, you've probably heard this. There's this whole, my brother's sister's cousin's mother's daughter is a school teacher in Shoot Your Dinner, Ar Arkansas. And she said that they're grooming them kids to do their peepees and litter boxes. And that's crazy because they want them to identify as furries. And it's just on its face a lie. It's a lie that has spread like wildfire and has been accepted and embraced as a reality when the reality of the kitty litter in schools is actually that teachers have have buckets that have litter litter in them in case they're on lockdowns for school shootings and the kids in their classrooms can't leave and need to relieve themselves. So the origin story goes yeah. back to something guns something they don't want to talk about right. something we can do something about but they've they've, they've co-opted it and turned it into an opportunity to fearmonger they've done it with transgender bathrooms 
They've done it with transgender athletes. They've done it with books. I mean, they've done it with drag queens. And none of these people know anyone who's transgender. They don't even know a drag queen. No. But but if they tell everyone the drag queen is coming for their kids when it's always white dudes who are doing it, yeah. then they win. I mean, that's the tragedy, isn't it? I mean, who would want to be a drag queen these days with the negative <laughs> right? press? Do you know what I mean? It's not even it's not even worth putting the makeup on, let alone the dress. <laughs> I feel I feel like the world lost you know lost sight of itself when drag queens reading stories to children became more dangerous than people with automatic weapons shooting dozens of children at once and 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 you know destroying them making them unrecognizable by nature of these weapons of war that seem to be available in every local retailer I mean, that that in itself is something that I just still cannot wrap my head around. And I feel like the in, if you grew up in America in the last 20 or 30 years, you are institutionalized. It's become normal. But for those of us on the outside coming in, and I speak as someone who had one school shooting in their country and then guns were banned, mm -hmm. um, and there hasn't been one since, I should say, but it 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 is so odd that people manage to get on with their day-to-day -day lives knowing that nothing can be done about this because people have this weird um obsession with with ownership of firearms it's a uniquely american problem i mean when you yeah. look at the rest of the world not just england but australia yeah. new zealand um, many countries around the world, when there was a shoot, a mass shooting, they did something about the gun, right? The guns. If you take the guns away, you take the ability to commit mass shootings away. Um, the United States has more guns than people. And this fixation obsession that we have with guns um, has jumped the shark and then some. But as a mom, again, um, that's really the undercurrent of everything that I am. Um, this is my number one issue because it's maddening because it's not a natural disaster. It's not a tornado or a hurricane. It's not wildfires, which we could argue aren't always natural disasters. Um, uh, wildfires, sorry. But, but this is a completely preventable phenomenon that we refuse, not me, we, not you, we, they, we, right, to do anything about. But what they've done instead is monetize the business of accepting this reality. And I worked as an educator for seven years and I saw the inside of active shooter drills, lockdown drills, shelters in place. Um, and I worked with kindergartners and uh, we pushed in, I was special ed, we pushed in with, you know, the general ed kindergarten classes and we had one kindergartner who wouldn't be quiet. He was just the kind of kid who wouldn't be quiet. And another child said to him, you're going to get us all killed if it's a real shooter. And I, it hit me, you know, like, like a lightning bolt. And ever since you, you said it's like from your perspective, uh, looking in, it seems, I, I'll paraphrase what you said, but it, it seems like madness. Because after Sandy Hook, I was sure, I was certain we, are, we were going to do something. Yeah. How could you not i mean these were six-year-olds six-year-olds who by the way their parents couldn't identify unless they remembered what they were wearing same thing in uvalde uh many of these cases um and i thought okay well certainly something will be done no and then we had parkland and aurora and uvalde and you just Buffalo and El Paso and Pulse nightclub and Las Vegas. And it keeps going and going. And each time the Republicans moved the bar from thoughts and prayers to n nothing, not even wanting to have the conversation. They didn't want to politicize. It was too soon. Um, and it's, it's maddening. But the thing is we are, this is one issue. I fully and fundamentally believe we our vote leads to direct action, period. You More Americans want common sense gun control. More Americans want safe storage laws, red flag laws, an assault weapons ban. Yep. Then don't. And we're not going to let the, the minority 
have tyranny over the majority on this issue because we can we can vote we can use our our voices and our the power to change our electorate to change our elected officials i mean um on this issue on many but this one we if we had a trifecta in november 1000 percent we're getting an assault weapons ban in 25 uh I'm a hundred percent sure of it. Yeah. We just have to. And, and make it is this- the assault. It is the assault weapon that is the common denominator in everything that you've described, right? Because, and and it's also the assault weapon is something that Republicans can't really argue against because you do not need one at mm-hmm. home. You don't need one. These things belong in the theater of war, and right. and yet there is this weird obsession with gun owners of having this. I mean, what are they expecting is coming? You know, maybe the the apocalypse or something. You know, I think I think Elon Musk, when he was launching the Cybertruck a few months ago, kind of mentioned the apocalypse a couple of times. And I was like, hang on a second, maybe that's <laughs> what these guys are all doing: is that they they are arming themselves for for the civil war or apocalypse or whatever is is coming that they've been because they're frightened. I mean, mm-hmm. they're just cowards, aren't they? And for those of us who don't own weapons. Maybe that's the proof that we're not scared because we haven't been, you know, we haven't taken on this propaganda and told that someone is coming for us or that, is, or that there are, you know, migrants who are murderers coming across the border. Right. Even after October 7th, um, Don Jr. and the like were on social media saying they're going to come across our border next, not Hamas, the nebulous they. Um, These these they they, they, again, the Second Amendment is another thing that they've completely co-opted and turned into this, you know, come and take it. uh, Don't tread on me. COVID actually helped a lot sort of compressing that and amplifying that and making them double down on this idea that they needed to arm themselves because the government was going to be coming for something. I don't know what, but that on its face is also kind of funny because there's one comedian who does a skit about like, you know, 500 dudes armed with, you know, dressed in tactical gear and armed with AR-15s and like, against the government and it's two guys and one guy has like a drone <laughs> and he's like so wait you're <laughs> yeah. telling me so these guys that are all together over here with the guns like that they're all clumped together that's what i'm up against and uh, again yeah. he's like okay he presses <laughs> a button and it's over i mean yeah. they're not arming themselves for <laughs> the government coming for anything and we also had an assault weapons ban thanks to joe biden during which time no one came for their guns they they didn't come for their revolvers but yeah. it's again it's part of this fear mongering that is at the center and that fear mongering comes from again like all doors like you said they lead to racism, racism and that's yeah. it's all part and parcel i think of it as like a, an octopus but with many more tentacles than that it's all connected to the same beast all of it but the, they are scared and you know what made me realize this more than anything was i think it was uvaldi where they all just waited outside the door uh-huh. they were armed the police were armed they had a training day the day before and they didn't go in and in and they didn't go in because they didn't want to get shot themselves right i mean to me that was an example of this machismo being you know i could see right through it and it was pure cowardice and there the time that they took to get that door open which turned out to be unlocked mm-hmm. was because they were they were cowardly Right. And it also speaks to the fact that no one needs a weapon that an armed to the teeth, you know, force is afraid to engage with. No one should have access to that kind of a weapon. And that person had two and was able to purchase 1600 rounds of ammunition in short order at the same time. Um, No one needs an AR-15, as you said. If you're hunting, you're not going to retrieve any of that for any reason that you'd be able to identify. It is it is about them being cowards. Um, and they do this also with, you know, religion, where they, they kind of cloak themselves in these ideas of this being about their rights or about being about what's fundamentally right or wrong. Um, and that's all kind of to, to, to disguise the fear or to kind of accommodate the fear or to make it look on the outside as though they're not afraid, but they are. And they are afraid because some of the messaging is working. But at the end of the day, not to sound like a broken record, they're afraid <laughs> that that birthright 
that yep. they've just always lived with where they could drive down the road at 3 a.m. and a police officer could be behind them and they don't have to worry if they're going to get killed, um, that someone's going to take that away from them. And that's really uh, that's really what's behind all of it. And and it's it's scary because it's definitely on. Um, it seems as though it's on the rise in this country. Yeah, the the great replacement theory and right. and, and others. Okay, listen, we have to right. take a quick break for our okay. sponsor, but I I want to come back and and talk about Joe Biden and his uh, State of the Union speech and how okay. he seemed to surprise everybody. Mm-hmm. That's next here on the weekend show. We often think living a more heart-healthy life means making big, unsustainable changes. Well, with Superbeats Heart Chews, you can get daily blood pressure support in just two tasty chews a day. And they even promote heart-healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Superbeats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. I know how much heart health is linked to other health issues, and I do my best to make good choices. Superbeats heart chews are part of my morning routine. Super convenient, I chew them whilst catching up with the morning news. They're effective and clinically studied. Superbeats is the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended beat brand for cardiovascular health support. They are entirely plant-based with no artificial sweeteners or colors. Double your potential with Superbeats Heart Chews. Get a free month supply of Superbeats Heart Chews on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews, valued at $25 with your order by going to weekendbeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at weekendbeats.com. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention. And Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. We're back on The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis, and uh, this is Jojo from Jersey. Um, Just picking one of your names there, just to (laughs) (laughs) introduce you as. Um, Joe Biden is uh, comes up for a lot of criticism by the media, obviously the right, but often, you know, Democrat or supposedly liberal thinking commentators. Uh, in fact, I was listening to NPR in the car the other day. A bit of a cliche thing for me to be doing, but there it is. And <laughs> even the reporting on NPR was was trying to both sides the whole, you know, the age of the candidates and and the you know the mental health of the candidates, and it was completely inaccurate. And uh, and in fact, I, I was listening to some uh, a study that was done about the difference between Donald Trump's brain and its deterioration versus Joe Biden's. And actually, you know, people comment, but they have zero expertise on this subject. And so the guy I was listening to is a senior lecturer at the uh, psychology department at Cornell University. 
And he said, objectively, Donald Trump has a documented history of lying that is so marked as to be considered pathological. Politicians often say untrue things, but the frequency of Trump's lying is so extreme as to meet criteria for sociopathic behavior, since he tells falsehoods across all life domains, from his personal relationships to business dealings and finally to politics. And recently, several clinicians have noted that the ways that he has begun to mistake words and lose his train of thought confuse Biden with Obama, particularly during long rallies held in the evening. These are examples of phonemic paraphasia, swapping parts of words for others that sound similar. And these are signs of early dementia, even though they're intermittent. And he contrasts that with Joe Biden and says that with Joe Biden, there's no evidence of dementia. There's no sundowning. There's no reports from staff or cabinet members that he's failing to stay on top of legislative or international issues. And this is in contrast to Trump, whose cabinet at the end of his term considered invoking the 25th Amendment, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> I mean, that's the clinician's kind of evaluation of it. At the State of the Union, I saw a, a very impassioned, energized Joe Biden, so much so that Republican commentators claimed he must have been on drugs. <laughs> I mean, what is the world coming to? The man can do no right. No, he could do no right. He went from senile, uh, you know, doddering grandpa to rabid Tony Montana in the span of a speech. Yeah. <laughs> and they somehow, they somehow kind of carry both these narratives at the same time, which cracks me up is that he's senile, but that he can somehow also, um, you know, coordinate four different jurisdictions indictments of, of of Donald Trump and simultaneously the rise of one of the most famous pop stars in history and yeah. a football team's Super Bowl wins, but he's senile. Yeah. But the, yeah. the State of the Union, okay, it's this makes me like this is the Joe Biden that I've always known was there. And a lot anyone who knows Joe Biden, I don't know Joe Biden. I've met him and he smelled like hot cocoa, it's true, um, mm. on a snowstorm night. But anyone who knows him really knows him, knows that that's not a surprise. That wasn't an aberration. It wasn't a one-off. He's been getting punched and kicked and smacked and spit on by everybody, including our own party, who's like, it's time for Joe to step aside, even though that would have been literally a disaster. And I would love for somebody like Ezra Klein to walk me through what that would have looked like. We're just going to bypass Kamala. But as all of that aside, he I've seen him speak many times. And he gave a speech in New York at an event recently called Broadway for Biden. And it was a lot of that speech, the really the, the parts where I think are his sweet spot. Like, like there's nothing and there's nothing that's beyond our capacity. There's nothing we can't do. This is the United States of America. Like it's just, it's so pro democracy, so pro America, so pro let's keep moving the ball forward. This is that we're not done. We're not perfect. We're not supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to be striving towards perfection. And he opened the entire State of the Union, by the way, with the issue of Ukraine, which is the issue of democracy and the issue of, of sustaining world order, a democratic world order, because that's what's at stake. And I think when he's in that sweet spot, especially when he's been kicked and insulted, he's an Irish Catholic. He's an old school Irish Catholic. He'll take so much. And he, you know, he calls t Trump names. He'll take so much and then he's going to punch back. And he was yeah. eager and ready for that fight because he was goading them and he got them to own themselves, by the way, again. But that's who Joe Biden is. And, and he's and back to this idea that he and Trump are the same in terms of their cognitive ability. Trump has to say he's cognitively there all the time because he knows he's not. He knows. And he said Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley, when he meant Nancy Pelosi. He knows he messed that up and he has to keep saying because he thinks if, you know, if you do that, that they'll believe it despite what he's showing you. Joe Biden slips on some words. He's a man with a stutter. He's a man who has to constantly overcome it. And he is old. Let's be real. He's old, but he's not so old that he, that he, he can't do the job. And I would argue to the day that I die that one of the greatest assets he brings to the table, much like Nancy Pelosi, is his age because it's equal to his experience. Isn't it interesting that whether it's ageism that's baked into the culture, I don't know. But him being a little bit too old 
could be the reason why America sleepwalks into authoritarianism. I mean, that's the saddest part of the story for me, is that you're going to take something a, a, as benign as age, him being three years older than, than the disgraced former President Trump, and, and make those three years the whole reason why you don't vote for him. I mean, it is insane. And I think that we need to make the point, as Joe Biden has, that you're not voting for Joe Biden. You're voting for freedom and democracy and business as usual, not for fascism, not for dictatorship or authoritarianism. And, and Joe Biden might be the torchbearer at this moment in time. But, you know, you're talking about a crossroads in, in American political history. You choose good or evil. And I'm hoping that people don't allow the fact that he's, you know, old and squints as being the reason not to choose democracy. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's been it's been absolutely maddening for me to hear people on in my party, you know, saying things to that effect. Um, but also that people will feel disengaged because he's too old. And I've made the argument about this that he doesn't have to be perfect. Joe Biden doesn't have to be your dream date. You're not marrying him. You're not having his kids. He just has to be a good steward of our democracy, a responsible steward of our democracy so that he can carry that torch to uh, along to the to what what is beyond this, which is 2028 and that's a whole new race, a whole new conversation. And maybe you can maybe you can find your perfect candidate. I'm going to guess you can't, but maybe you'll find someone who's closer to perfect for you than Joe Biden. But but right now, what's at stake, what he is standing against is is the end of American democracy. He's never once said, even in jest, that he wanted to be a dictator on day one. He's never intimated it. He's never praised authoritarians. He's never said that Victor Orban was a strong leader or that Kim Jong-un was respected by his people. He's never said any of those things. He's never quoted loosely Hitler in a positive way. He wants to continue to carry this democracy forward. And he's doing a fantastic, he's not just doing it as a placeholder. He's doing a fantastic job, which doesn't get talked about enough. I mean, his accomplishments rival the best presidents of our entire history. But the media doesn't like that narrative because they want the horse race and Donald Trump makes them a lot of money. And I, I, I sometimes I get really mad about that, but you know, if you don't mind, if you can indulge me, I'm a really big fan of a mixed metaphor because I'm a very lazy writer. And the way I explained it and something I wrote recently was if you've seen the movie speed, <laughs> okay, you're going, you want to go to the mall and you're going to take the bus, which people do, I guess, but I, you know, <laughs> I don't, and you have two choices. There's the bus that you always take that's been getting into the mall whenever you want to go to the mall. And it takes a little while to get to the mall and the bus isn't fancy and the seat covers are a little worn down and it sputters and sometimes and it goes a little slower than you would like. And you kind of, there's a diesel-y smell to it. Or you can get on the bus from speed if it slows down long enough for you to jump on. And that bus might maybe probably not get you to the mall, but it most likely <laughs> will explode um, unless you have Sandra Bullock driving it, which is <laughs> yeah. not entirely impossible, but still these, these are your choices, right? Like anybody who's like, I, you know, I really prefer that bus with the bomb on it. It's just it's more exciting. It sizzles to the bus. that's just consistently been getting you there, but it's not just getting you there. He's gotten us actual infrastructure. He's lowered crime. He's increased the GDP. <laughs> he's increased the stock market. You know what I mean? He he's he's done incredible things for this country. And he's not just a steward in that way, but um the idea that people could pick one issue, whether it's his age or his stance on one or two things, because they're not perfect for them and roll the dice on another four years, which would be perpetuity wouldn't be four years with Donald Trump. Um, it's really short-sighted. And I've learned not to lecture. Apparently that doesn't work. But gently reminding people of what's at stake is something. And I'm not so gentle about anything, but they need to be reminded a lot. How do you feel when you see the clips from these Trump rallies where people are interviewed and they're like, well, America needs a dictator? It's about time we had a dictator. You know, what, what went before hasn't worked, so it's dictator time. Because, you know, a lot of them have been brainwashed to think that dictatorship is actually a, a better direction for the U.S. than democracy. Well, it, 
it shows you a couple of things. It shows you that we have now the bulk of Americans have no idea, you know, what that even really is or would look like. You know what I mean? We've American the the bulk of the American population wasn't alive during World War II. You know what I mean? They don't know this sort of threats. Um, they don't know what it represents, um, what it would actually look like or will be like or feel like. It's this abstract and it's the strong man, right? Like he's he's convinced them that the government is failing. And so we can't play by the government rules because the government is corrupt and it's failing. And he needs to come in and be, you know, extrajudicial, be out exist outside of the rules. And that's the only way that you can really fix it. And have um, full immunity again, as well. Well, right. It's immunity from everything always, which goes back to something he said in 2016, which is that he could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and not lose any voters. We've really come very full circle where he's essentially saying now that that is what he could do if he wanted to. I mean, his lawyer argued that he could send a sealed seal team six member to assassinate his political rival. And unless the Senate convicted him, <laughs> he would be fine. Um you know, and it's, 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 it's pure lunacy that anyone would say that they would prefer to live under a dictator because what that would mean for them, most of those people saying it, <laughs> is that they would be working for the government and handing their money to the government. They might be handing their wives to the government or their daughters to the government. And by the way, if you end up having a special needs child, you might want to wonder what's going to happen to them and anybody in your family you love. If it, what if they happen to be, you know, gay or transgender? Consider that. They don't think. They don't think any thought through past what they instantaneously feel gratified by, which is we need a strong man because things here are broken. When things are not broken, in fact, Trump's lying to them all the time. When, what do they say all the time? America's gone to hell. That they're going to save it, bring it back, bring it back. And then they say this thing all the time now. Weren't you better off four years ago than you are today? Really? <laughs> should should we not analyze what that really means? Because, again, this goes back to racism, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. when you have a racist in chief, then that gives license for voters to be racist. When you have somebody at the top who has no respect for women and doesn't care for you know anybody but himself, that enables his supporters and voters to not have to care for anybody else and only care for themselves. And, you know, apart from that kind of check that he arranged at the beginning of his presidency, that, that kind of whole 401k thing, and then the check was delayed because it wasn't, he wanted his signature on it, so it looked like it was coming from him, but it was actually just a rebate for <laughs> mm -hmm. so people getting their own money back. I mean, that was, that was a bribe that he did very early on because he knew that if he gave a, the, the, you know, this is what he's good at, is the marketing. He made it look like people were getting a check for a thousand bucks under Trump's presidency. Well, that's all they got because there was nothing else for those people for the next four years, apart from him being abusive towards women, migrants and shithole countries. So is that is that not what they say? You know, make America great again is about making America white again. And actually, the, those four years that in their minds were better was because he was in charge and and therefore they had license to be who they really are they didn't have to behave to fit into a moral code in society yeah i mean I, again my love for mixed metaphors i often think of him as a black light that if you know you go to a hotel and they say not to use the top comforter because they don't typically wash it and so my brain goes to that dark place where i wonder what's on that comforter and how many people have been on that comforter nice. Trump is the <laughs> Trump's the black light that comes in yeah. and exposes what's on the comforter. But more than that, he brings it to life um, right. and emboldens the worst, the darkest, most deeply buried thoughts. Um, I wouldn't even call them thoughts, but but beliefs and resentments that people have been carrying around, things that they used to feel back when we were politically correct and woke that they had to whisper and discuss in the shadows and in the quiet. And then along comes this self-made billionaire, all a lie. And he says, I'm done with political correctness. 
I'm done. I want you to be able to say whatever you want to say. And I'm going to say the things I want to say. And if that means that I make fun of a disabled reporter right now and you laugh and cheer, then that's what it means. If that means that I mock a gold star family, that's what it means. If it means that I demean a POW for being captured when I got five draft affirmants and you hate people like that, then so be it. Because what I'm giving you is so enticing and so attractive. It's it's telling you that all that stuff that you used to feel ashamed of saying, you shouldn't anymore. And not only can you say it, you can act on it. And I'll reward you with my with with getting power. And then I'll give you the things that you want, like me up there at this bully pulpit all the time, confirming your hatred is right. And you can't put that toothpaste new metaphor, back in the tube. You just can't. Like you give that to someone, hate, and embolden it, and and indulge it, forget it. They're yours forever. And it's become a cult in that way. And I apologize. I know I'm going rambling here, but it's become a cult in that way where you can show them the facts all day long. You You can give them a list of all of the things Trump promised. All the things Trump promised. Like he was going to battle pharmaceutical companies. He didn't. Biden did that. He was going to have Mexico pay for the wall. He didn't. In fact, Biden just offered to give like six hundred fifty million dollars toward the wall that he was going to bring back coal and manufacturing. He didn't. He was going to bring back jobs. Worst jobs president since Hoover. You can show them all the stats you want all day long. They're not going to believe it because that thing, that golden ticket that they got to feel hate and say it unabashedly and unabatedly, that's all they need. That's all they need. And that's what will always sustain them. So it's make America white again, make America racist again, make America misogynistic again, mm-hmm. make America abusive again, and, yeah. and, and don't make America shy or make make America not shy to say what you really mean about people, and 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 so that it's that that empowers them. It's that feeling of having some ownership back again, and it, it connects with the racism and the the Great Replacement theory. And they'd rather take that over the idea that society could be more equal, that they themselves would benefit from paying less taxes anybody you know under who earns less than four hundred thousand dollars would with the democrats it, it, it's it, it, this is the thing it's like turkey's voting for thanksgiving isn't it because <laughs> other than that you know make america racist again there re- really isn't anything else that they are benefiting from other than maybe feeling part of a movement part of something and that's the cult that you describe yeah again to pick up on your metaphor there's um a famous cartoon where it's a wolf and he says i'm going to eat you and it's a sheep farm or pasture and one of the sheep says he really tells it like it is and it's again it's sheep voting for the wolf uh, another thing i wrote about because they they don't they don't need they don't need to talk about or think about all of the things that they're taking away from themselves or that they're imper- imperiling themselves at all. They, they can't even go there because that other superseding thought, the thing that eight years of a successful black presidency broke in them, um, that they can't get that from anyone else. And um, well, now they have the entire Republican Party, of course, helping them along with that, which is really the abdication of that party in as a whole is really something I also didn't expect, but yeah, I mean, it's, that's all it is. And that's not really sustainable unless you have a dictator, right? Unless you have an authoritarian, you can't sustain it as a government because eventually people are going to be like, um, my road, it's like one big pothole (laughs) and you just, you just can't sustain it unless you, you decide to be a dictator on day one. There is a shortage, or maybe people have forgotten their their civics class at school, you know, just understanding the way government works and why it is necessary. And, you know, painting the government as the deep state. And, and, and that kind of connects with his, you know, desperation for immunity so that he can do what he wants and he can control the justice system. And as you know, my, my prediction is that he will slip through the fingers of justice. I've been saying it for the last year or two. 
and I, I personally don't believe that he will he will ever you know be prosecuted properly for for the crimes that he has committed but that's because the justice system is so unjust the injustice system and the fact that judges are politically appointed and I mean, Eileen Cannon is a perfect example, you know, as a Trump appointed judge who is drawing out the process as long as possible because Trump wants to be able to get to the election. He thinks he can win and then he can shut down all of these investigations. I mean, it, it is as simple as that, really. And in the process, he's grifting and making money, raising money to pay his legal bills. And now we have the infiltration of the RNC with his with uh, Lara Trump and, and goodness knows where that's going to end up. But, you know, a lot is resting on him thinking that he can win and, and, and change America to make it, you know, Trump's America. Um, well, what are the odds of that? Because, you know, uh, Joe Biden in the polls in the, just in the last couple of days is actually, you know, starting to see you know, that things are turning. I think the State of the Union obviously had something to do with it, but he's gained a narrow lead now in, in two polls. It's eight months before the election. Um, Biden might marginally beat Trump in the Reuters Ipsos poll. Uh, it said Biden would get 39% of the vote. Trump would get 38%. And in the civics daily cause poll, uh, it was Biden 45%, Trump 44%. And uh, this was surveys done just in the last few days. I mean, that's the first polls that we've heard, not that we ever believe them, but it's just a talking point. First polls we've heard where Biden is starting to push ahead. Well, I think America might be slowly, collectively coming to its senses. You know, there was they're letting go of any idea of somebody replacing Joe Biden because that was a fever dream. And if you wanted to have that conversation, it needed to happen a long time ago. Yeah. But now that Nikki Haley's out of the race and it's a binary choice, it is a binary choice. I'm not going to even indulge Aaron Rodgers and RFK or Jesse the body or whoever the hell he picks her is running me to joke. <laughs> but now that it's, it was always going to go this way though, I will say now that it's becoming increasingly clear that it's a binary choice collectively America's like, do we want the speed bus? I'm like, I'm like kind of thinking, <laughs> just yeah. want to get to the mall. Yeah. And you know what I mean? It's like, can I pull the lever for the speed bus? I don't know. And then, you know, he gave that great, incredible, like state of the union. I may have seen clips. Maybe I didn't see it. Maybe I saw the whole thing. And he seemed like he wasn't senile. And he seems like he's doing a good job. I'm like, hold on a minute. Does my life suck? Like, I feel like my life doesn't suck. Wait a minute. <laughs> didn't you get a raise? And is there a house worth more now? And like, Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, inflation sucks. Gas is going up again. But by the way, we're pumping more gas than any country in history or more oil. Um, but I digress. It's I think what's what's happening, I pray this is what's happening, is that America is like, okay, we know Trump is a known entity. We know what we would get. We know what he did after he lost. And that actually has obviously shrunk his support. Significantly, you saw all those Haley voters saying that once January 6th happened, they said they could never. And by the way, that's yeah. another that's another way they've revised history where they've revised those attackers into being hostages. And what did he call them? Oh, gosh, oh, I'm going to think of it. But political prisoners. <laughs> yes. Well, they're, yeah. they're seen as martyrs now. And then right. by that by that group. And again, as you say, it's a rewrite of history. But, you know, with Mike Johnson putting out the the tapes of, of January 6th and just showing the bits before it all happened with empty hallways right. and being like, oh, it was just a, you know, a, a, tour, a tourism <laughs> outing. I mean, you know, he, he is getting, so Trump is getting support from various places, including an endorsement from Mitch McConnell last week as well, which, you know, McConnell might have checked out physically and emotionally, but that is also very dangerous, isn't it? Because there isn't, apart from, as we know, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, there isn't a solitary member of the Republican Party that is has chosen to, or maybe Mitt Romney, I should mention him, that ish, that, ish, that has that is even got the strength to stand up to him, and that is the true sign to me that he is not going to be a dictator on day one, but he is already a dictator. He was a dictator during his presidency, and he continues to be a dictator because everybody is terrified of him. 
Yes. And it's it speaks to their ability to lead, obviously, inability to lead. They should not be trusted with positions of power. Look what they've done with their House majority. They've whittled it down to essentially one. Yeah. Um, Ken Buck is like, I'm out. Yeah. Um, and this sort of whole hog abdication, um, it's really disheartening to see but it reaffirms why the adults in the room, which are the Democrats who want to continue to progress forward as a, as a democratic nation are the ones that we should be voting for. Um, but he, he's a, he's like a mob boss, right? It's it, he is a dictator. Just take, for example, <laughs> Republicans were screaming for something to be done on the border. Joe Biden has to do something. This is a crisis. He has to do something. He has to do something. So what happens we get one of the most conservative senators there is, Lankford, and Katie Britt, by the way. They get together with Chris Murphy and some other Dems, Kirsten Cinema, who I don't love, but still. And they're, she's in a border state. And they get together. And they're like, all right, let's craft a bill. And the Republicans are like, we want a whole bunch of stuff you guys have been not willing to talk about. And the Democrats are like, OK, well, let's say we'll give you like a lot of that and piss off our own party. But, you know, we understand this is a crisis and you want us to do something and let's do something. And they're like, let's go. It's like, yay, high five. We did the thing. And then Trump says, I don't want you to do the thing. Wait, you're going to fix the border under that guy? No, 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 no. I want you to let it be chaotic. I want it as bad as possible. I just want I want fires and murders. And I just want it to be really bad so that I can run on how bad it is, which proves that it's not that bad because they're all like, oh, the crisis? Yeah, we can wait. In fact, we can wait until January 2025. It's fine. And they killed their own bill because yeah. the mob boss dictator on day one, who's already a dictator, told them to. And the American people need to hear that every single day. They now own this issue because they abdicated to a madman yet again. Do you think that that message will get across, though, because of these information bubbles that we exist in and the and the lack of crossover and the and the lack of journalism in cable news because you know it is a simple thing uh, it, there is a lot of clarity to it i mean the other thing they're not saying is that the border is more secure now than it was under donald trump and mm -hmm. has been under joe biden's presidency there's just you know trump had covid and during covid the numbers dropped because every, there was a stay at home order in every country. No one was going anywhere. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Trump took ownership for having the most secure border, but he didn't. Right. And, and, and I'm not hearing that either. So do you get frustrated as I do that sometimes the Democrats are, you know, they say a lot of stuff, but sometimes I wish they would bring the receipts. <sighs> yes, sometimes, but I am in the receipt business <laughs> I like to bring the receipts a lot, and I know yeah. a lot of people who do. Um, and so I think the key there is that it's easy to get disillusioned and disheartened because the messages aren't getting out the way we might like them to. Part of that also is Steve Bannon's um, theory. I don't know if I can swear, so I'll just say flood the zone with crap, yeah. um, where there's a lot of crazy and a lot of of, of, of balls in the air that were that Democrats have to try and manage all at one time um, and messaging successfully when MAGA is so good at like CRT and, you know, woke this and just really bite sized stuff um, that the messaging might get muddled sometimes. But it's all the more reason we have to just keep pushing the truth. I mean, that I say this all the time. The more they try to constrain uh, people's access to information, the more we have to push back, the harder we have to push back. Because once they have that, um, that component all is lost. So because also we've seen on socials that they're trying to restrict some of the political accounts. And Nancy Pelosi, what did she say? OK, so let's just take this in terms of money. They might have the money, but we have the people. And that's the thing we always have to remember. Not only do we have the people, the majority, but we have the people, the talent, the people like you, the people who keep saying the truth, the people who keep pushing for democracy. You you can't underestimate that. You can't, um, you really can't triumph, not in this country. I fundamentally believe that, over that. So we have to just keep going and keep pushing the truth. And that's, that's the best way to combat it. We have to take a, another quick break, but I want to come back finally and talk about 
Trump's legal position. Uh, this is after the news that uh, Forney Willis is um, allowed to continue in her crusade against Donald Trump and um, where that might end up next on The Weekend Show. I'm excited to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink is a meat subscription box company on a mission to fight for the family farm. They're located in rural America, run by an eighth-generation female farmer. Their animals are raised humanely, their employees are paid a living wage, and the quality of their product is better than anything you'll find in a store. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. I've received one of these boxes and I can verify that the quality of the food was excellent and it tasted delicious too. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash weekend now and listeners of this show get free bacon for a year. That's one year of the best bacon you'll ever taste but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K box dot com slash weekend. That's moinkbox dot com slash weekend. Ten seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base? How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling t-shirts and Midas Touch merch, and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back on The Weekend Show with Joanne Carducci. I'm Anthony Davis. The Fulton County DA, Forney Willis, the case against Trump that uh, she brought forward can continue if she or Special Prosecutor Wade removes themselves, the judge has ruled. Uh, the Trump co-defendant, Michael Roman, accused Willis of misconduct for her clandestine relationship with Nathan Wade, whom she appointed as special counsel. I don't know about you, Joe, but I found that whole thing utterly frivolous and ridiculous. It didn't make any sense. They're both on the same side. I think she was the third. He was the third prosecutor. She tried to, you know, nobody wanted to take the case. She ends up with 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 this guy. But you know, we hopefully should all be able to keep our private lives private and our professional lives professional. And that is just something that we should all be able to do because Donald Trump has never been able to do that because he doesn't have controls over his own behaviors that he then projects that Forney Willis can't either. And, and that's really what I got from all of that, that whole kind of drama was that really it was, it was Republicans just demonstrating their inability to separate business and pleasure. Um, what, what's your feeling about all these legal cases that are in the ether at the moment? Because it does seem like slowly, slowly, especially with the Supreme Court, Donald Trump is chipping away at justice. Uh, it's, it's interesting because 
Republicans and MAGA always talk about the two tiers of the justice system when it applies to someone like Hunter Biden. Yeah. But what we're seeing in real time is the two tiers of just the justice system as it applies to Donald Trump. Because I'm pretty sure, like, if, if I, you know, got fired from my job and then, like, decided to, you know, incite a bunch of people to come to my job and try and kill the people who fired me from my job, that, like, I wouldn't then be able to run or try and get that job back. And I'd probably be in jail many years ago. But not only has he not really faced any legitimate, I mean, he's not, he's not been convicted. Um, these trials have been drawn, dragging on forever. And he's got a very favorable judge in the documents case, which if you ask me, is the one that I think we need to know the most. <laughs> yes. Um, before because of he, national security. Right. Uh, and the, because yeah. now he is the, the presumed candidate, Republican candidate, traditionally, you know, the, the president gives access to that candidate to the daily um, national security briefings. I know, terrifying. Right. It's not a requirement. It's it's a courtesy. So it doesn't it doesn't have to happen. It's traditionally happened because we haven't had yeah. <laughs> traitorous madman um, as the candidate. Uh, but it's it is so frustrating, especially with the Supreme Court, especially with the fact that the Supreme Court has no real oversight of any kind, um, that Clarence Thomas is ruling on cases that directly implicate his wife and best friend, um, that that they can put their thumb on the scale in this way, or that Judge Cannon in Florida can rule the way she ruled yesterday, that essentially is just slowing this thing down so much so, so that it's impossible that it will ever be heard before the election where we're voting for whether or not that person should have access to the kinds of information he may very well have sold. We don't know. That's what we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. We can assume a lot, right? Um, the fact that we're getting now a 30 de day delay maybe in the hush money case um, because the Department of Justice didn't get the information to the DA fast enough. Um, it's a, it's really frustrating. But at the end of the day, um, I am an optimist. And I do believe that justice finds a way. I'm going to plug a book. Um, and the book's been written many years ago that changed my whole mindset on this. And it's Doing Justice by Preet Bharara. Preet, call me because like we haven't talked in a while. But the book is is fantastic and it's that idea that it may take time it may not look the way we want it to look but i i do believe that donald trump will will have to face true consequences for his crimes and and maybe it'll take a lot longer than i hoped but i still believe it i mean it could end up just being one crime that he faces justice for and yeah. you know and not the other four <laughs> or 12 or, or 91, 91. And, and, and this is <laughs> yeah. What's so frustrating about it, isn't it? Because yet again, it is a white, wealthy, you know, man who is getting away with it. And when we look at the statistics on incarceration, invariably we're seeing young black men in, in, in prisons for minor crimes, you know, for, I don't know, marijuana, for example, which in many states is entirely legal now. I mean, it's so... It, 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 there is so much hypocrisy in this that this this white collar crime is is yet again you know on on national television and, and he seems to be getting away with it and in fact the um, retired federal judge um, J Michael Luttig issued a, a rebuke of the Supreme Court's unanimous decision that uh, Colorado could not disqualify Trump from the ballot under the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, he, he published a piece in the Atlantic on Thursday, and he said that. Um, the uh, the uh, nine justices of the Supreme Court dangerously betrayed democracy in making their decision. I mean, he's talking about nine of them, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he didn't single out the the Republicans on the on the court or the Trump judges on the court. He referred to all of them, and and I would agree because you know that everybody felt that that lower court ruling was so well written, and and that they they couldn't argue with it they wouldn't argue with it you know the, the and yet it just didn't play out like that which is why i think that when they hear this immunity case that the likelihood is they probably will find him immune for some things and not others if not just running out the clock until november i mean am i am i naive or are things because i mean i remember thinking this about brexit 
It's like it'll never happen. And then suddenly all my all my fellow Brits decided to, you know, be entirely xenophobic in their vote. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't want to, and I'm sure you did the same over Hillary Clinton in 2016. So, yeah. so, so should we trust our instincts? Are we taking these moments for granted? Who do we trust? Ourselves. I mean, we have to, because to your point, I mean, there are a lot of forces at play in favor of Donald Trump. There are mm. a lot of really significant forces the Supreme Court is one um, that are out there advocating quietly, right, for his presidency, return to the presidency. And we're up against that. Um, But for this election, we still have the power to shape our own realities. And this election doesn't just shape our reality right now. Potentially, it shapes my kids, my grandkids, my grandkids, kids, realities, because this is the edge of a cliff. And um, we might also be looking at, you know, Donald Trump getting three more seats on the Supreme Court, depending who decides to retire, because, you know, Alito and Thomas, at least, are holding on right now for dear life to see what happens in November. But we have to, um, we can't, no institution is going to come and save us. It wasn't ever designed to work that way. No there's no Superman. There's no Batman. Uh, it's not going to be the Supreme Court. It's not going to be any court. It was never supposed to be up to the court. It was supposed to be up to us, we the people. I keep going back to that um, because fundamentally this is about us. And maybe maybe in the, the Colorado case, maybe the best course of action was that he was on the ballot so that the people of Colorado could make that decision too. And so we have to trust ourselves to be able to to meet this moment and to push back this threat, sustained threat from all these different prongs, very powerful prongs, um, and prevail. But that's that's the end of the day. We have to trust ourselves and we have to trust this gift that democracy gives us, which is the vote. If they were making a movie about this moment in time, it would be a significant cliffhanger, wouldn't it? Because, you know, you could argue that this is the most important election in American political history, certainly in our lifetimes. And, and, and do you think people realize what's at stake here? Because, you know, I often think that a lot of people don't really know what democracy is. They haven't, you know, they've taken it for granted so much that they don't, they can't really define it. And, and democracy is now increasingly becoming something that is exclusive to Democrats. Yeah. I mean, I will, I know, enough now in my life to admit the things that I got right, right and wrong. And I know, even as someone who studied um, politics in college, that I took democracy for granted. I know that. I, I guess it was like gravity to me. I just always assumed that it would be there and that I could engage with it when I wanted to and selectively and conveniently and maybe it'd be fun. But uh, all that jumped out the window <laughs> um, when Donald Trump came onto the scene Um, Because he proved to us that democracy is a daily practice um, and that as American citizens, that it's required of us to engage with it. Um, And so, you know, I I think, um, again, that's what's fundamentally unique. But I think that a lot about America, I think that a lot of Americans have taken it for granted. But I'll tell you who doesn't take it for granted anymore is every woman and girl who lost 50 year held fundamental human right to bodily autonomy in one ruling 50 years reversed by five people who are we didn't elect and are there for life and that was when a lot of women in this country and men and young and young men too woke up and said oh crap i did not realize that was at stake. I didn't realize that that might be taken from me. And I'll tell you, you know, one other sort of analogy here, who else doesn't take it for granted because they know the power of changing who, who our elected officials are, are the survivors of, 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 of gun violence. Because what they say to me, to a person, and I've talked to it's quite a few now, because this is the world we live in, is they say that um, before it came for them, before it impacted them directly, that they would that they would see a shooting on the news and think that's not me that doesn't impact me i can empathize with that 
but that's not my life. That's not my reality until it was. And then they said, why didn't I do more before it came for me when I had the chance? And those are the people also who understand now that democracy is not something you can take for granted because this is something we can change. Um, so I understand why a lot of Americans have taken it for granted. I did it too. But we don't occupy that reality anymore. We can't occupy that reality anymore because the person is the person that is coming for all these these rights is telling us. Yeah. He's not having us guess. He's telling us what he'll do. What finally do you think we should, you know, if we were going to give advice to people, because people write to me all the time and they're like, you know, great show, but what can we do about it? <laughs> right. And so I really want to, you know, answer their, their question. And I, I've realized that, you know, it's not just about the vote, but it's also about encouraging others to register to vote because they might not be registered and also explaining to people what is at stake this this you know the difference between a demagoguery and democracy and 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 fascism and, and freedom the two very different cultures lifestyle choices political systems whatever you choose to call it so so what what recommendations or suggestions do you have for people who feel activated who are you know are are, are connecting with stuff that you're saying what can they do next well, political activism isn't one size fits all. You know, there isn't one uh, thing that might work for, you know, one person that fit, that works for every other person. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to make phone calls. Maybe the kind of person who likes to knock on doors. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to fill out postcards. Maybe you're just the kind of person who likes to have conversations with your friends, with your peers, where you talk to them, but mostly you listen to them. And then you have those discussions about what's at stake and what, what you could gain and what's happening right now. And maybe you have young people in your life who, who don't feel like they, they want to, that, that their vote will change anything. Um, you know, uh, uh, Heather Booth, she's one of the founders of the Janes, which was an, an underground movement um, before Roe to help women get abortions. Uh, she says it, and Nancy Pelosi says it also, we don't agonize, we organize. You know, we could wallow in, in, in what we are afraid of or what we might lose, but we, we don't have to because the antidote to that is it's to organize, is is to get involved, is to help people be encouraged to vote, is to help people get to the polls. Um, so you can reach out to groups in your town, your local community. You can go online. There's a, one group. There's a group for everyone. There's there's suburban groups. Of, you know, there's there's sports groups. I'm sure there's there's every kind of group out there where you can find a home. But you can do something large or small. Everyone can contribute in some way. And 1000%, the number one thing you can do that I will scream from the rooftops for as long as I live is vote. That is our power. That's what you have to do. And you have to encourage everyone in your life to vote because they might not think that there's something on, on the line for them in November. But there is something on the line for all of us, and that is this democracy that so many take for granted. So vote. Joanne Carducci, thank you for joining The Weekend Show. Thank you. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Download the five minute news podcast and join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. <laughs>